Hello, welcome back to Talking Politics with the Post Millennial. We're a day later than usual, and I do apologise. We had some uh, scheduling conflicts, but all was resolved uh, by our knight in shining armour, uh, Roberto Wakewell Cruz, who's the news editor here at the Post Millennial and a good friend of mine. And I do hope you enjoy the show. Yeah, sure. So I'm introduce me, give me an intro, give me, a, give me everything. Did yeah. you get, uh, did you start, did you prepare an intro? I always prepare an intro. Okay. Yeah. Right, ready to go? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking Politics. Uh, today, uh, we have a rather exotic guest, but it's okay, it's the news editor of the Post Millennial. He's a great guy, he's a good friend of mine, and that's Roberto Wakebrook Cruz. Bobby, thanks for coming on. Wow, Nico, thanks a lot for that intro. With, uh, <laughs> with friends like you, who needs enemies? Yeah, nice one. Yeah, yeah thanks. How's so, it going? It's, it's, oh, it's fantastic. And I'm actually quite happy to have you on because I'm always a bit nervous with speaking to, like, you know, Brian and Lily or Pierre Polyev. So sure. with, uh, with you, you know, I feel like I'm more upbeat. And it's good because we've had a massive week in Canadian politics. Like, really exciting. We've had like the Meng Wangzhou case, however it may be pronounced. We've had the yes. care homes. And underneath all of that, we've had the pandemic. So if we're going to start anywhere, I think you obviously cover news. You see all the breaking stuff. How do you think Trudeau has been handling this pandemic? His approval ratings are through the roof. Yeah, that's just because he's the guy in charge and everyone's watching him on TV all the time and he's handsome and he does hair flips and he gives really uh, long-winded answers to simple questions and people think he's charming. Um, you know, everyone seems to have a high approval rating right now, even, you know, Francois Legault, Doug Ford on a provincial level, who I don't think have necessarily done great jobs, but uh, just by the proxy of it, it's almost like, you know, George H. W. No, George W. Bush. Uh, Bush Jr. Yeah. after 9-11 had the highest uh, presidential approval rating in American history. He had a 99% uh, presidential approval rating. And that's just because uh, New York City had been attacked um, <laughs> and 3,000 people died. And in, in those moments of a, a lot of intensity, people do rally behind their leaders and yeah, approval ratings go up. George W. Bush uh, I mean, at that point, it was only a year into his presidency. He didn't really have a chance to totally ruin himself. He yeah. went out at the Yankees World Series game and threw a baseball, and everyone lost their minds. Um, so probably the same thing with Trudeau. Um, but more or less, do I think he's done a good job? Not particularly. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the latest numbers are, but I think about, what, 7,000 people are dead? Yeah, um, in the camp. Uh, cases, we'll say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he didn't close the borders on time. He let people from China come over. Tourists, uh, 2,000 people from the Wuhan area come into Canada. Uh, meanwhile, he has a doctor lady who uh, seems like she's in whose pockets? Whose pockets? The World Health <laughs> Organization. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Teresa Tam, um, who said that Canada was uh, at a low risk, a low risk country for the coronavirus. Meanwhile, we have 80,000 cases now. Uh, gave us a lot of loads of misinformation and uh, you know it, it just it just seems like the whole thing could have been handled a little better considering and here's where, where I kind of this is why I got fooled into this are you sponsored by Tim Hortons sorry this is why I kind of got fooled initially because uh, we Canada was the only country outside of Asia to have uh, death from SARS right yeah. About 15, 16 years ago, uh, SARS pand uh, epidemic came through and killed, I don't know how many people actually killed, maybe 400, 40, 40 45. I don't really, I'm not totally sure. But uh, I thought we had it in the bag because we should have had some foresight after that. We, sh we should have kind of woken up and gone, oh, wait, uh, this could be a big thing. The, the Rolling Stones played in Toronto because like 40 people died from SARS. And uh, meanwhile, 15 years later, SARS's cousin, literally just like the same thing, comes <laughs> again, and we all have no idea what to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, do, uh, what would I rate it? I don't know. Uh, probably three out of three out of ten. Yeah, I'd really? say three. I don't know if, if I'd rate it that low. If you compare it to other countries, for example, my home country of Britain, it seems that Canada has done a pretty good job. So I think 
it's, it's part of the reason of that is that so much power is delegated to the provinces and the provincial leaders in almost every case are more competent than the prime minister and yet the prime minister has been attempting to grab power every step of the way to try and handle it and you know if he handles it anything like the shutdown canada protests i, I don't think it's going to go particularly well but there's a point of the high approval rating and the issue is that the conservatives don't have a leader they're fighting within the party like there's just no tomorrow they, they don't care what the consequences are they just sort of want to win it mm. and on top of that it's a minority government which yeah. means Trudeau can effectively call an election I mean there's been some speculation that it may happen in fall but it's going to happen pretty soon and if the Tories don't get that act together then we're going to see a strong Trudeau government for another five yeah. years it's well this is the weird thing because uh if you had told me all these laws that were passed and all, all the uh, insane spending that's happened, and you told me this is a minority government, I would have yeah. thought there would have just been a law somewhere that says that can't happen. <laughs> but well, uh, There should be. But, I mean, look, the NDP yesterday signed away our democracy, essentially, to give everyone 10 days sick leave. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't believe they did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it just goes to show, if you're handsome and... Uh, and motivated and the son of a prime minister and yeah. you love uh, uh, a hostile ethno state, anything is possible. And on that note, uh, on loving a hostile ethno state, he sort of does. And uh, can I, I want to get your uh, opinion real quick yeah. on, uh, uh, I, I don't know how much you, if you've been following the Mang Wan Zhu case, but I would just like to say really quickly, I was a bit surprised uh, that, that uh, we made it a little more difficult for her. Um, to get what she wants. I don't exactly know what happened, but uh, it sounds like, uh, I was surprised just because of how all the news lately, it sounds like the liberals and just the government in power, everyone is so pro-China. Uh, it, it's, it's an interesting point. And, uh, but we still very much, we have a strong independent judiciary. And, you know, I, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't know whether she deserves to be guilty or not. Although it's certainly paid way for her to be extradited. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but if it didn't turn out that way, I think they would be in a very difficult position. But what I'm very excited to see is that the US will put in the extradition request for her to come back. In fact, they already have. That's going to go to the Liberal Justice Minister, who, of course, it, the Justice Minister is a partisan position, which means mm -hmm. kind of screwed either way, because China is going to be applying a lot of pressure on Canada to make sure that yeah. doesn't happen. But the Canadian population, as we've seen through recent polls, just detests the Chinese yeah. regime. Something like, so this, this is the, I, I actually looked this up before. There was a, a poll done, uh, I can't remember if it was by Pew or somebody reputable, like uh, that kind of, I can't remember exactly. Angus Reid. Angus Reid, yeah, it was Angus Reid. Um, and it, they found that 85% of Canadians think that China is dishonest, right? Uh, which leaves, and here's just a fun number game I, I like to play. So 85% of Canadians think China has been dishonest in their figures, right? Trudeau in the last election got 6 million votes, okay? 6 million votes out of 37 and a half million people is what, Nico? 15%. So <laughs> if we look at the poll, 16%, I think. If you look at the polls, 85%, that's everyone that didn't vote for Justin Trudeau. Everyone that thinks China's dishonest. And then the 6 million that voted for him are the people that uh, they said they still trust China because even, even though we shouldn't. The Liberal Party in Canada has an unbelievably strange relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. And for yeah. me, this is highlighted best through their ambassadorial appointments. So they yeah. The last two ambassadors, the first one was a guy called John McCallum, who just took ultimate pleasure in going on Chinese state broadcasters to denounce either the American president or to denounce the Canadian judiciary. And like, I don't, I don't know what he was thinking, but he was eventually fired after he made yeah. an outrageous comment about President Trump. And then the next guy they brought in, who is, oh, I forget his name, but he's, Again, just I, I, it's so extraordinary. I can't believe it happened. It turned out to be this banker 
who spent his life in China for McKinsey, who went to a Communist Party retreat that was held four miles away from a Uyghur concentration camp. So it's crazy. You probably see it. <laughs> like, you know what I think it is? It, it, Trudeau, so Trudeau's dad, also named Trudeau, uh, Pierre <laughs> Elliott, uh, went to China. He was, I think, the first Canadian prime minister to go to China. And he, yeah. met, with chair, he met with Chairman Mao, who was uh, towards the uh, end of his illustrious career as murderer, dictator of China. Um, and he, he met with them, and they, this, the two, I think, got a lot, like, he, they had conversations. Uh, you know, there was a statement, yeah. a statement, statement. Yeah, Trudeau had a habit of uh, getting along pretty well with communist despots. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well exactly, right. So yeah. I feel like what happened is that Trudeau, because he, it seems like he's, in a lot of ways, he's trying to carry on his father's legacy through some of his, uh, some of his action, the actions that he takes, you know, the post-national Canada those kind of real sentiments that, that he brought in with them into the prime ministership. But, uh, so, but the, the, such a big part of it's missing. China doesn't like him so, and they don't respect him. They call him a little potato. And that's, you know, that's a nickname. And that is a little unfair to say, because uh, I guess in Chinese, t potato is too dull, which just sounds like Trudeau. So they just call him, they just call him potato because that's what his name is. Maybe, maybe his dad was big potato. I actually don't, <laughs> don't know. Uh, but yeah, they don't respect him. They push him around like a, like a pansy. Uh, they, they don't treat him with respect. Meanwhile, Trudeau is trying so hard to, to suckle up to uh, a man uh, who is uh, Xi Jinping, Winnie the Pooh guy, uh, who is very intelligent. He's power hungry and he has a lot of leverage. Which is not a good combination, and they've it's shown a on multiple occasions that they're totally willing to mess with us and mess with us in ways that like ruins our economy, like <laughs> ways like all Canada had to do. First of all, they stole two of our Michaels. Canada has two less Michaels because of these guys, the Chinese government, right? Michael Corvig and what the other one, yeah. uh, something. I'm sorry, I can't remember his name. Um, they just decided to stop buying canola and it totally ruined the entire province of Saskatchewan. Just nobody knew what to do because they would stop buying canola. Yeah. And uh, what was the, other, the pork? They stopped buying pork from us and then everyone in the country doesn't know where to, what to do with all their pigs. So they're not a nice guy. They're not a nice guy. You don't want to play with China. <laughs> yeah. The, well, you, gotta, uh, uh, you said how they don't respect him. I don't think there's a leader of the G7, because you know, a lot of people dislike Trump, and I think they make fun of him behind his back. But it seems when Trudeau goes to these sort of G7 summits or NATO summits, yeah. <laughs> it's so embarrassing, and everyone just takes the piss out of him. Like there was that moment when Pierre Bolsonaro where he just <laughs> shake his hand. Yeah. yeah, no, which, you know, <laughs> say what you want about Jair Bolsonaro. <laughs> but it's not even, you know, no, it, these I know, I know. dodgy people. It's Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister of Australia, came out in a recent biography and said, yeah, you know, we're, we're at one of the most important trade negotiations we've had in the last decade of, of sort yeah. of Anglo-sphere relationships. And Trudeau couldn't stop talking about his sock. And it, it, it's embarrassing. It's really embarrassing. It is blatantly embarrassing. Uh, you know what? Like I said before, I think 16% of people voted for him. That's all you need in our system because, you know, you have a parliamentary, uh, whatever it's called. And uh, that's, who, that's who won. Luckily, a minority. I would hate to see what would be happening right now if this was a majority. I imagine we'd all just have to wear a T-shirt to say, <laughs> say I, love, I love Serb on it. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't really know where that's going because if, if an election's called, you can win a majority – and then who knows, he'll probably go down in history as one of Canada's most beloved, respected oh, prime well, ministers who led us, it's going to happen, who led us through tough times, saw us through, and then as soon as he gets out, we're going to have to deal with the debt, and everyone's going to start crying because we're in a yeah. trillion dollars worth of debt that we just accumulate, accumulated in four months because no one had foresight and thought money was free for a day. Yeah. yeah. So. I, I, the worst thing about it is in sort of three decades, we're going to get Justin Trudeau's son. And we're going to start this sort of, <laughs> this dynasty in Canada of incompetent leadership. Yeah. Not but, looking forward to it. No, not looking forward to it. I, you want to hear my advice? And uh, I, I'm a financial advisor. Um, <laughs> buy Bitcoin. You can get sued <laughs> for that. You can't do that.
I'm not a financial. Yeah, I'm not a financial. <laughs> <laughs> Moral, Jesus. But what? Well, anyway, let's go back to how Canada is dealing with coronavirus. There, and and in particular, we've discovered throughout this entire process that it disproportionately endangers elder people, the elderly and vulnerable. And in fact, yeah. in Canada, something like 81.2%, it might even be 82% of all coronavirus deaths have taken place in long-term care homes. Yeah. And, you know, that in itself is deeply troubling. But then we keep getting reports out of Quebec. There was a horrifying report in Montreal Gazette about the Bird Garden, you know, long-term care home, which was, they, they alluded to it as being like a concentration camp, like the liberation of one of the Eastern European concentration camps. And now we found out that the military found the conditions so bad in Ontario that they leaked it to the press because they just didn't think the government would have sorted it out. I mean, mm -hmm. do you think Doug Ford has some responsibility for what went on in those long-term care homes? Yeah, uh, a little bit. So from what I could tell, it sounds like it's been a problem for a long time. And I believe that because I don't think these places can get that bad in two years or however long Doug Ford has been yeah, in office. Years. About two years. There's no way cockroaches and nurses it, – it, it's a cult, that sounds like something that's wrong with the culture of the nursing homes. And uh, I do put I, – I would pin some blame on Doug Ford. It sounds like he made some cuts uh, earlier on, probably like everyone else didn't see a, a pandemic coming. And it's a shame because, you know, everyone – I actually don't really like some of the rhetoric that going around about coronavirus uh specifically like everyone people our age and i understand why are saying like oh it's not a concern you know um it, it's only old it's only old people that die only it's, it's like only in the nursing homes which yeah that's true and that's i totally understand the, the line of thought but you can't say it's only in nursing homes that it, it's a great disrespect to a person's life if you just say it's only old people it, it, for the sheer reason that it's so bad in nursing homes. You have nursing homes that are getting totally swept up. Nurses are dying. 20, 30 people in a, res in a residency are dying. That's like plague levels of insane yeah. if, if, for old people. And, you know, the Spanish flu is different, much deadlier. We didn't have medicine. But if you're old and you have a vulnerable immune system, or even if you're just like, you know, 65, this changes everything. You got to be a lot more careful, I, I, in my opinion. What I, what I will say, though, we should, probably shouldn't have locked down the whole country. I think some of the yeah. some of the measures that were put in place were totally uh, just making no sense. I mean, uh, I went to the park yesterday, and they're still trying to enforce weird, dumb, like that make no sense, not really practical ways of yeah, like making people tape around rocks and stuff. And <laughs> yeah, they put police tape. There was a, a small soccer net, like just like a, in, in a field with no nets. And what they did, they wrapped. Uh, caution tape around the nets, which if I was a goalie, I'd be like, sweet. I get a little extra, you know, my, my left side's a little weak. Now I have some caution tape there. You can still play soccer. And this is the craziest thing about this whole, it, it, it doesn't make any sense because, well, what could you, if you close off soccer nets, you know, kids in Africa can make a soccer net with two cans. All it takes, you just put a shirt and a can yeah. this far apart from each other and you have a net. So I don't know who you're stopping from playing soccer. I don't really know what you're just trying to discourage people and other things like that. You know, the, the numbers, didn't, it didn't make any sense. I could go to a grocery store, uh, but I couldn't uh, go to my friend's house. Meanwhile, a cashier wearing the same pair of gloves is touching everyone's stuff. Um, you don't know if someone's put something back. It, uh, you're all crammed in. You're in line. They, it, they keep you separated when you're in line, at the, but not in the aisles. No one pays attention. There's arrows in the aisles. It, yeah. it, it was all ridiculous. It all didn't help. I don't think it's proven effective. I don't think there's been any real evidence right. that lockdowns have Very worked ridiculous. in any significant degree. Yeah. And uh, I think we made a huge mistake and we're all going to pay for it in 20, 30 years. But I'm going to be moving to French Polynesia. where <laughs> Hopefully yeah. I will get along well with the locals and I won't have to deal with uh, the massive dump that uh, our current prime minister took on yeah. the future. I, I, I know... Um, as one of our senior editors likes to say, retrospect is 2020. So it's pretty easy, you know, two months later to say, yeah, oh, we should have done all that. But it, it appears to me that we did have data coming out of China that said old people are disproportionately affected by this. Doug Ford knew that 
it's impossible for him not to know that if it was a systematic error in the long-term care homes, as he keeps talking about, like he did that press conference where he said, okay, well, I'm not going to take responsibility for this. Firstly, because it's been going on for ages. It's always been bad. And secondly, this is a pan-Canadian problem. It's not just Ontario. Yeah. But the issue of that is, is that, okay, so we knew it was going to affect old people badly. Mm -hmm. And we knew that the long-term care homes were in a terrible state. It was yeah. A Anyone could have told people. you that. And anyone yeah. that knows someone that's been in a long-term care home could, could tell you that. My grandmother exactly. was in one. Um, I, uh, a, a girl I was seeing for a long time, her grandmother, I would, we, we would visit her. And those places, it was up in Montreal North, uh, you could tell were just like understaffed, overworked, dirty, not meeting their needs, uh, not filling out, not fulfilling basic requests, like getting them out of bed, taking them outside feeding them at the right time, sometimes medication, which is uh, pretty important if you're a, 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 someone that's elderly. Um, I think everyone knew that it, this was a problem. Nobody really wanted to look at it. D Doug Ford did take, he took a d degree of responsibility. He said, the, the buck stops with me. But then he went yeah, on to say, said, yeah, but then it's a hand grenade <laughs> issue and it was Kathleen Windfall. <laughs> yeah. And he's not going to fire his minister of long-term yeah, care you know, it's really because strange. he's doing a really good job. <laughs> it's, it's, it's someone called Minister Fullerton. And, yeah. uh, and I used to work in Ontario government, full disclosure. Sure, sure. sure. She works in like, the same office floor as I did. So I've always yeah. had, like, she used to make me coffee and stuff. But anyway, so I feel a bit guilty about what I'm going to say next, which is she has to go. You can't, you can't protect it. This is her briefing. You know, she, it, she, it was her responsibility. If she was the minister for that and had no idea that coronavirus was going to just mess up these facilities, then that is either serious neglect or incompetence. And I think it's, it's, her position is untenable. And I'm surprised there hasn't been a huge backlash about it. I think that's the problem with the Canadian media, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not so surprised because I've seen... I mean, it, once it gets into that level of, like, nitty-gritty... Uh, I, feel, I feel like just the less premiers talk about it, it'll probably go away eventually. She's not going to step down. I don't think she's going anywhere. She might actually work hard, but it sounds like she's never stepped in a nursing home, which <laughs> if, if I were the, the, the uh, minister of long-term care, I would probably, you know, live in one for like a week and see what happens. You know what I would do? This is what I would do. You That's know, and like, uh, uh, you know, those guys from Jackass, they put on the makeup and stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like old and grandpa. the old the old people makeup, like in Dirty Grandpa or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I would I would put on that. I would put on that with like hair and everything. I would stay in one for a week. This would this would be great, by the way. I know it sounds like a joke, but it would you would be a hero to the, the health, long term healthcare community. I would yeah. make a fake identity and stay almost like a almost like what's that show called under undercover chef or I'm undercover boss. boss yeah yeah <laughs> sorry i was thinking about chef i was i'm hungry <laughs> but anyway that's what i think you know that kind of sub, uh, that kind of submersion and while that might be a little extreme yeah. i'm just saying she should visit them sometimes <laughs> it, it reminds me of a story this is totally different but somewhat similar sure. there was yeah. like in iraq there was this myth or it was like a legend that one of their most famous kings used to dress up as a peasant and then like spend the nights out in his town just amongst you know the peasants and then yeah. he eventually found out and it made him a hero. Saddam Hussein saw that but what he did is he dressed up as a normal person, brought a whole camera team, sort of filmed these poor people. <laughs> So, what do you think about Saddam Hussein? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I don't think people actually end up liking that too much. You know who else did that to a small Romanian village? Uh, Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> when he uh, when he portrayed Borat, his great character Borat. Yeah. The movie I saw in theaters when I was 11 years old with my father, by the way. And uh, just over the top hilarious, probably the hardest ever. Anyway, he went to the small Romanian village, said he was doing a documentary, said he was from Kazakhstan, uh, portrayed the village. It's a gypsy village, right? Yes. Or Ro Romani village, whatever you, Romani village. Um, yeah. Portrayed it as if it was Kazakhstan, went all around, made fun of all the locals, said that's Claude, that's our uh, blacksmith and abortionist, and <laughs> like all these awful titles. 
And now he probably can't step foot anywhere close to that village or he'll die. So maybe my idea is bad. Maybe uh, that's not a good idea to submerge we'll yourself. Out. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere in between the two, I think, is probably probably best. Anyway, yeah. that was a bit of a tangent, huh? Eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's good. One of the more one of the things that I found really fun this week was seeing and, and I suppose it could be just the last topic we touched on. Sure. The, the Tronte Star being purchased. And it's brilliant. And the reason why it's brilliant is because ten years ago the star was worth a billion dollars. Now, it could, like from yesterday. The Tronte Star was bought by these two Maxime Bernier trust fund babies. <laughs> <laughs> it just donates to the Conservative Party at every single opportunity for $54 million. It's just extraordinary. And the reason why I think it's quite interesting is because there's only two things that's going to happen to it. The first that's going to happen is they're just going to turn it into like, I don't know, it's going to swing to the right a little bit. And sure. just you know, join every other right wing newspaper in Canada. So it is pretty much the only left wing newspaper. And secondly, yeah. they're just going to strip it for all it's worth. And it's just going to die in 10 years. But it's, it, it speaks volumes about what's going on in Canadian media. Why do you think it's just failing everywhere? The post millennials are anyone who's actually making a profit or doing well. Because there's a huge divide in Canada between cities and people not in cities. Yeah. Um, I think the metropolitans are so far detached uh, in every province, uh, basically. Toronto is not Ontario. I think anyone that spent time throughout Ontario knows that, you know, Lindsay is not the same as Etobicoke. Um, yeah. not, not even close. The, the culturally, there's a huge divide. And those are the people that work in those positions it's all much metropolitan rich kids i went to college got a ba in english have some opinions and some journalistic uh you know they're curious people uh and i think it doesn't lead them anywhere and people aren't interested in the stories they tell which is basically all you have to do yeah. uh, i mean all you have to do is capture someone's interest with things that are going on and generally people are interested in what's going on in their community so if you can't even do that, then, I mean, why do you have a job? It sounds like they're not going to for too long, sadly. <laughs> and it's a shame because I like local yeah, news. I love, I do, I love local news. I think I, I like, I always read the Windsor Star, even though I don't think it's particularly, I'm from Windsor. I didn't think it was like the best paper in the world, but I always wanted to know what was going on. Um, when your own, when your own, the, the Toronto Star, which I imagine thinks of themselves as like the New York Times of Canada, which they're not can't capture the attention of a small country, basically like half the size of New York, uh, tell national stories that people are interested in, then maybe you deserve to go belly up a little bit. And I think that's kind of what's happening. They're going through the ringer. You look at some of the things they publish, and it's just kind of like, I mean, granted, every newspaper has its fluff, right? Yeah. But <laughs> everybody has their fluff. But I think print media, it's dead. It's dinosaur media, old, out, in with the new. They're I think there's so nothing. out of touch. They're I'm so like, out of touch. Look like they employ like this this sort of <laughs> this brood of metropolitan essentially college educated women to talk about gender issues and like you know all, all that stuff. and I, I don't think anyone cares like i, yeah. I don't think if you're going to spend money on a newspaper you don't want to have to flip through like 10 pages of gender issues and stuff no like exactly that. or just like remember i, I, I that that article by uh, what's her name heather malik yeah, what's her name? She, she's the uh, gender and diversity correspondent. No, no, no. Is that Heather Malik? I thought she was just a columnist. Heather Malik wrote the article uh, for some reason about stabbing a raccoon. You don't remember when that happened? I remember I wrote a, a she, I, I reached out for a comment to her trying to explain what the hell she was <laughs> talking about. So I guess her neighbor was screaming and she saw a raccoon on the street, a little, you know, pa uh, pa uh, trash, what do they call them? Trash pandas getting sprayed by a hose. And then uh, she went out and she grabbed a fork from the, her picnic table there and it charged at her and she said she stabbed it. Oh. Uh, and that was news enough for her <laughs> 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 to write a column on it. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's, you know, I, I can't remember the podcast I listened to. There's a great podcast about the raccoon problem in Toronto that was actually interesting and engaging. Yeah. You have, to, you have to look it up. It's a shame I can't remember what it's called right now. But there's stories there, you know. Um, you, you can capture the interest of people. But when it's just, you know, 
not it doesn't necessarily have to be a lady but uh, a man even tells a story that is uh, uh, annoying and useless then what do you think the response is going to be i don't know not too great and it, yeah it looks, there we go yeah John star is worth what now 50 54 million 54 and, million so and, and that includes like three sort of offices as well which must be worth about 50 million so <laughs> yeah that's a, that's insane yeah, yeah. so I, I i don't uh, I'm not particularly sad about it, I guess, is the, the, the short answer about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would have to agree. Roberto, thank you so much for coming on. Really do appreciate it. Nico, um, thanks for having me. Uh, it just want, uh, Thanks again. Uh, this is one for the fellas, all my uh, vapors out there. Just have a... Oh, God. Perfect. That's my, <laughs> that's my sign-off signature. Right. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>